Grace and peace to you all, and welcome to the Calvary Road with Pastor Sam Allen. Any human being between us and Jesus ultimately can and will get in the way. We need to get alone with Jesus. That's my suggestion to each and every one. We need time undistracted where it's just Jesus and us. Quiet time where we can listen to the Lord, where we can catch a fresh vision of the Lord and fresh vision from the Lord. We're now in Matthew chapter 17, and we begin a new message entitled Transfigured. Now, outside of encountering the risen Jesus, seeing him transfigured with Moses and Elijah must have been one of the most mind-blowing things Peter, James, and John ever witnessed, and that's saying a lot. Let's take a closer look at it. Let's turn in our Bibles to Matthew 17. We're looking at the first 13 verses today, the title of our message, Transfigured. We read here in chapter 17, it was six days later when Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves, and was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. And suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. Then the disciples heard it. They fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise and do not be afraid. And when they lifted their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. And when they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Jesus answered and said to them, Elijah truly is coming first and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the son of man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. It was a moment frozen in time, an experience that left a permanent impression on Peter, on James, on John. It was the fulfillment of a promise made just a week earlier by our Lord. We read of it there in the last verse of chapter 16. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. What was happening here is Jesus was giving them a foretaste of the future. He was opening the windows of well, so that they could see who he really was and, and he could see where all this ultimately was leading. Now, it wasn't a complete fulfillment because, well, when that comes, the kingdom will have been established. But what it did is it sort of provided some insight, a down payment, if you were, well, to some things that were sure to happen later. We have a similar experience in Acts chapter 2 where on the day of Pentecost, many of you familiar with the great miracle there where God moved on this group of 120 believers gathered in an upper room. They began to speak in languages they'd never learned. Great crowds gathered around. And Peter arises and gives, first of all, a scriptural basis for the phenomenon that was taking place. We'd be wise to always ask, where is this in scripture? Where does the Bible say these things will happen? Well, Peter not only gives a scriptural basis, but he points us yet further forward by saying, this is that spoken of by the prophet Joel, saying that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Now, if this had been the actual fulfillment of that prophecy, the kingdom would have been established then. Then. 
But what he was doing is he's saying, again, a down payment, a preview of coming attractions, a bit of the future here today. You see, 120 people had the Spirit poured out on them, and then 3,000 more as they were added to them that day. But it was just the beginning of something that is yet future. And truly, that's what was going on here. The kingdom hadn't come, but the king was manifesting himself, and they got to see a glorious and radical transformation, a glorious and radical transfiguration. Now, 35 years later, Peter was still considering all of this. It was still ringing in his ears. It was still in his mind's eye. And, and he actually writes in his second epistle, and you don't have to go there now. We will go there at the conclusion of our time together. And so when I say turn to Second Peter, you'll know we're wrapping it. But for now, let me just read you a couple of things. Peter says in chapter 1 of his second epistle, we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. 35 years later, Peter's still saying, man, we were there and we saw him and we heard the father and the father, well, it was still working on him and working in him. John likewise makes mention in his gospel account of Jesus' life. In chapter one, he ties two radical and glorious events together. In John 1, 14, he says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's the incarnation. That's the theological term. Not important that you know that word as much as what was taking place. God, the real, the true and living God, became a man born of the Virgin Mary. And the early church fathers had it right. Fully God and now fully man. And so John says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, speaking of the incarnation. Then he jumps forward to the transfiguration when he says, and we beheld his glory. Some would say, well, no, they beheld his glory right at the birth. They really didn't. There were some radical and wonderful things that accompanied the birth of Jesus. But you got to know most people had no clue who he was. And even when he grew and began his public ministry, giving sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, raising the dead. People still failed to recognize him. The vast majority of people looking forward to Messiah still rejected him. And so these three, they beheld his glory. Where? They're on the Mount of Transfiguration. Well, three things then in these first three verses. First, separation. Jesus gets Peter, James, and John, and he takes them aside. He takes them alone. It says six days later, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, brought them up on a high mountain by themselves. I would suggest to some, and this may be what God actually has for some of you out of this entire study, that we need to learn to come aside. We need to learn to shut out distractions and to get alone with the Lord and just worship Him and study His Word. Now, I know what some of you are thinking. You're thinking, wait, that's what we're doing right now. We've shut out all distractions. We're worshiping the Lord and we're studying His Word. That's absolutely true. But we haven't really shut out all distractions. I can be a distraction. I can get in the way of you actually seeing Jesus, though that's ultimately my goal, that you would see him and hear from him and be transformed by him into someone more like him. Here's the problem. Any human being between us and Jesus ultimately can and will get in the way. We need to get alone with Jesus. That's my suggestion to each and every one. We need time undistracted where it's just Jesus and us. Quiet time where we can listen to the Lord, where we can catch a fresh vision of the Lord and fresh vision from the Lord. 
we need to come aside before we come apart. And there are a lot of us that are right on the cusp of coming apart, breaking down. Instead, we need to pull aside and come aside and interact with our Lord. So first, separation. Secondly, transformation. If you read through the various gospel accounts, and Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell this story, relate this this historical event, they were sleeping and Jesus was praying. That's a bit telling, you see. Even later in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying right prior to his arrest and crucifixion, What are the disciples doing? They're sleeping and Jesus is praying. And so I get a picture here that I think the Lord would have all of us grasp. And that is it was in the midst of his, well, fellowship with the Father, his prayer to the Father, that he was transformed and began to demonstrate outwardly what was really going on inwardly. Note the description, transfigured or transformed, as some of your Bibles may say, comes from two Greek words, meta, which means change, secondly, morphe, which means form. It's a change of form. But what's happening with Jesus is is he's actually allowing what's inside him to be manifested on the outside. John gets this, by the way. He'll later write that God is light and in him is no darkness. You see, Jesus was transfigured or transformed. He underwent a metamorphosis where what he was inwardly could be seen outwardly. Why was that necessary? Well, his own humanity masked his perfect deity. I know that's a couple words we don't use every day. Well, humanity, you know what that means. That he was truly and fully a man. But he was still truly and fully God. And because he walked in the flesh, as it were, because he lived among us and was one of us, people failed to grasp his glory. Even in the midst of his miracles and his teaching and all he did, they didn't sense or get who he really was and what he came to actually do. Now, I was thinking about this and I was, well, contemplating what would it be like if our inner person was fully manifested on the outside? If people walking up to us could see exactly what we were about, what we were like, it'd be, and someone suggested some time ago, it'd be like if we had a little monitor on our forehead that actually showed people what we were thinking or what was going on inside of us. Husbands, we'd be in big trouble. You know, your wife comes up and she's like, what do you think? You know what a guy thinks when his wife says that? What do I think about what? And if you're stupid enough to say that, well, then you're going to get this. If you don't know, I'm not going to tell you. Uh, Maybe you've been down that road, played that game. Uh, Well, is it the new hair, a new outfit, new shoes, a new makeup? Do you get a nose job? I mean, I don't know. I can't tell. I'm just a guy. We don't observe or notice these things. But it could be way worse than that, you see, because that that little monitor would reflect all that was in your heart and mind. And I am grateful, truly grateful, that my heart can't be seen because it isn't always right and, and neither is yours. And that my attitude can't always be seen because it's not always right and neither is yours. The only one who could manifest what he was on the inside outwardly and have that work to the betterment of people was Jesus. You see, when we see what he's all about, it's pure glory, it's pure beauty, it's pure love. But unfortunately, that's not our story. We were born in sin and we've proved, demonstrated that we're sinners by acts of sin and rebellion against God and against his holy law. And so here's the good news. Not only can't people read our hearts and minds, but God can. And knowing us perfectly, he still chose us. Knowing us intimately, he still forgave us. You know, Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed. That's our word. Be transfigured, be transformed. And he tells us how? By the renewing of your mind. What happened happened instantaneously for Jesus Well, it happens gradually for us. 
as we become more and more like him. It's interesting to me that it's Moses and Elijah here. We'll, we'll see for a whole lot of reasons, but, but one of them that I have to point out at this point has to do with an experience that Moses had after he had a private time with the Lord. He'd go up on the mountain and he would spend time with the Lord. And when he'd come down from that experience, he'd literally be glowing. Now, it was a reflected glory, you see. It wasn't radiating from him because he wasn't transformed. He wasn't born again. He wasn't a new creature in Christ. But just being in the presence of God caused him to glow. And if you read through the accounts, you'll find that he put a veil over his face, not so people couldn't see the glory, but so they couldn't see that it was fading. You see, Moses' glory would fade because he was no longer in the presence of God, and it was God's glory he was reflecting. Now, something awesome out of 2 Corinthians for us. He says, our glory isn't a reflection of the Lord. It radiates him. Why? He indwells us personally and individually. And as we are transformed from glory to glory, we're told, we become more like him and people see more of Jesus in us. It's one of the great joys of being in the ministry that to get to watch people who were struggling and striving and and just rebelling and resisting the Lord and then they give up and, and begin to walk with him and begin to grow in him and become more like him healthier relationships better choices a, a, a better present and a glorious future it, it's a joy to behold well in the midst of all of this this separation and this transformation, there's a conversation going on. And we're told in verse 3, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. Now, apparently they'd woken up by this point, And they see Moses, and they see Elijah, and they see Jesus just glowing radically. Remember the description there in verse 2, Transfigured before them, his face shone like the sun, his clothes became as white as the light. Well, they were talking, Moses, Elijah, and Jesus. And Luke, well, he tells us in chapter 9 of his account of all of this, that they discussed Jesus' decease. It's an interesting word for us. It's actually our word, Exodus. It's Luke 9, 31. They spoke of his decease, we told, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. They talked about his exodus. That's the word, really. And as surely as Moses led the children of Israel out of the bondage in Egypt, that was their exodus, see? Free from the slavery and bondage of their past life. That's what these guys were discussing. Jesus, it'll all happen through the cross. I know. I came to lay down my life that they might have life eternal and life abundant. They discussed his decease, which he would accomplish at Jerusalem. It's strange, if you think of it, that they would use the word accomplishment for the cross. That they would use the word accomplishment for his decease, for, for his crucifixion. But, but here's why they chose it, and here's why they used it. The truth is, it was an accomplishment Jesus said, no man takes my life from me. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This command I receive from my father. I don't know if you've been tracking. A lot of people upset with Mel Gibson right now. He's got a movie coming out that portrays actually the passion, the death, the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus. And some people are upset because they say, well, this paints us in a bad light. Among those current living Jews. Well, I got some news for them and for all of us. Of course it paints them in a bad light. They handed him over for crucifixion, you see. That's a reality. And they might say, well, it wasn't us, it was our ancestors. Well, nevertheless, they're saying, well, our ancestors are getting a bad rap. Not really. They were getting an amazing deal. When Jesus went to the cross... He came knowing that was going to happen. And yes, the Jews handed him over and the Romans crucified him, but they're no more guilty of Jesus' death than you are or than I am. And here's why. 
Jesus died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried and rose again according to the scripture. It wasn't the Jews. Yeah, they handed him over. Yeah, they rejected him and, and that's their sin. Yeah, the Romans crucified him and that's their sin. But Jesus died for you and he died for me. That's our sin, you see. And, and so... A powerful picture. From the cross, by the way, our Lord cries out, It is finished. Mission accomplished. Paid in full. That's what he did there on the cross. He fully atoned for every sin of every sinner who ever lived or ever will. Now, tragically, that doesn't translate into all people are going to be saved and everybody's going to go to heaven and it's just going to be glorious. And here's why. The pardon was made possible through his death for you. But you need to receive his forgiveness. You need to confess your need for his forgiveness. You need to ask him to come into your life and be your Lord and be your Savior. Or his death for you will not be efficient for you. Sufficient, absolutely. But not efficient until you recognize, until you repent, until you confess, until you receive. Well, the conversation then leads us to have to consider the participants. And it's interesting, Moses and Elijah appearing to them, talking with him. Moses and Elijah represented in their generations. They were long apart in biblical history. It's not like they lived at the same time or hung out or were buddies. They were just two men that walked with the Lord and represented the Lord. But they represent the Lord today in, in a variety of ways. First of all, Moses represents the law, Elijah, the prophets. Moses and the law, you know, he was the one who received it and then gave it to the people. And the scripture tells us, John tells us, that the law came by Moses or through Moses, but grace and truth through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the law points out my great problem, and that is I'm a guilty sinner and he's a holy God. The law says thou shalt not, and I've noticed I did, and I do, and sadly will. I can't meet God's righteous requirement because I'm still a sinner. I'm still walking in this body of flesh that really, though, I say, hey, you're done. You're history. I'm going with the Lord. I'm walking in the spirit. The body says, well, we'll see. And there's this constant battle between the flesh and the spirit within me and within each and every one of us where the flesh wants to dominate our lives and the spirit desires and rightly so to dominate our lives. And so what happens is, well, this battle rages, this war continues, and in the midst of it, Moses reminds me that, well, the law condemns me. And then Elijah reminds me of the prophets, points us to the prophets, because he was, in fact, a fearless prophet of the Lord. And the prophets, they point to the solution, you see. The law, my dilemma. I'm a guilty sinner. The prophets, God will send a savior. God will send Messiah. God will send his son who will atone for sin. And then ultimately, you see it. There's, there's Moses, the law. There's Elijah, the prophets. And then there's Jesus, the fulfillment of it all. He kept the law perfectly. He, he kept it perfectly. And he died well, a substitutionary sacrifice for you and for me. He was the one the prophets pointed to. When Jesus came on the scene, he didn't just bring the solution to sin. He was and is and will always be God's only solution for sin. I have heard some refer to Jesus' death on the cross as a tragedy. Nothing could be further from the truth. I will confess, when I think of him being crucified, it breaks my heart and brings me to tears. But the reality is that it was a victory. Victory over death and sin. The true tragedy is why he had to die. True tragedy lies in mankind's rejection of God's grace. True tragedy lies in even one of God's beloved creation being lost to eternal damnation. 
The Calvary Road is a ministry of Calvary Chapel Chico, and you can visit our website, ccchico.com, or download the CC Chico app to contact us and listen to other studies from Pastor Sam. You can also listen to The Calvary Road as a daily podcast by visiting thecalvaryroad.com. We'd love to hear from you. And until next time, may you find grace and peace as your journey takes you down the Calvary Road. And your grace, it surrounds me. And your peace, it fills my soul. And your gift of salvation in your Son.